So, when I started thinking about the promise of patient-generated health data and what I was going to say, I started in probably a fairly traditional place. I thought, OK, well, I can talk about what kinds of data that patients generate, that what are the differences between patient-generated data and the data that we traditionally use in um, health service delivery, or we, we traditionally capture all of that translational, uh, transactional data? Because, my goodness, we are great data collectors. Um, I could talk about the relative strengths and weaknesses, pros and cons of each, etc. There are a whole lot of things we could talk about including quality and how we actually govern patient-generated data. But then I, as a data guy, and I've been working with data for 40 years now, I and mean, you can't do digital health without data, um, I went back to basics and said, well, what promise? Data only exists for a reason. For every bit of data we have, we need to know why we want that piece of data, how we got there. And so we walk around our organisations, I walk around a lot of different organisations and continually talk about data being an asset. And it should be, of course, but it's not always. Data is a tremendous asset if it's high quality data, if it actually measures what we think it measures, if it's reliable, etc., and we can define what we think about quality. And it's also really an asset if we use it properly. But if it's not high quality data, then it's actually a liability. It can take us to the wrong place entirely. And if we spend all of these resources capturing all of this data and we don't use it, then it's not an asset, it's an expense. So when thinking about the promise of patient-generated health data, I started thinking, well, OK, in relation to what? And the answer was right there on the same slide, in relation to rethinking the healthcare landscape. So I'm going to focus on rethinking the healthcare landscape and talk about how patient-generated data can help us do that. Now, if we're going to think about the healthcare landscape, and we've done a bit of that over the, the last couple of days, quite a bit of it, we really do have to step back from where we are now. Those of us who work in health service delivery, it's, a, it, it's just a fast-moving conveyor, conveyor belt. We're so busy doing what the next thing is in, on that conveyor belt that we often don't get the time and the, and the headspace to take a few steps back and think, well, why are we even doing this? Why couldn't we do something completely different and maybe get to a different destination, maybe a better destination? So the focus of this talk is about asking you to do some of that stepping back. So if we're going to rethink the healthcare landscape, we would start by asking some fairly fundamental questions, wouldn't we? We'd start asking about what is health? Now, we've had some discussion about that over um, yesterday and certainly today, including in the, in the last panel. What is this thing that we're actually dealing with? What is health? In our health services day to day, do we focus on health or do we focus on ill health? It's a pretty important question. If we know what it is, then how do we measure it? What determines it? How do we generate it? How can our various stakeholders, our industries, our governments, our businesses, our societies, our consumers, how can we actually deliver health to ourselves and to our populations and customers? Well, we've just had one demonstration, one very active demonstration of how we might deliver ourselves some health every morning. 
Um, is that sustainable? If we're a private business, can we make a buck out of it? If we're a government, can we afford to do it and do it and do it over and over again? And how can we measure what we're doing? There's some of the questions that we need to ask about rethinking healthcare. And I'm sure you can begin to see there are some important data aspects associated with those questions. So what is health? Well, as I said yesterday and as a number of people have either said or alluded to, nearly 80 years ago now, 80 years ago, that's a long time, the WHO enshrined its constitution a definition of health. Now, yesterday we asked the question in one of the panels that I was on, well, how have we strayed so far from that mission? Because most of us in our health service organisations concentrate just on the last three words, disease or infirmity. We don't have anything to do with the vast bulk of the definition. So if we're going to be rethinking health, and the healthcare landscape, let's think about health in that sense. Let's not think about ill health, let's think about how we can reimagine health and the care that produces health. So my second question on that previous slide was how do we measure it? Well, turns out the WHO does measure it routinely. There it is, for a whole range of countries. Don't worry about trying to read the slide. Um, if you want to see where your country sits on that scale, just go and look up on the WHO website. It's right there. There's only a couple of important things. One is that the blue line represents average lifespan at birth for various countries. And the orange line represents healthy life expectancy at birth. And obviously, the orange line is always below the blue line. So we don't have to go thinking about how we measure health. It's, it's done for us. Now I can flash up some definitions here. Um, WHO measures health, healthy life expectancy using health adjusted life expectancy. And look at the keywords in that definition. It's a very strong reflection of that WHO definition of health, isn't it? It's the number of years we live in full health in the absence of infirmity and disease, basically. So, and again, if you want to work out, if you want to know exactly how the WHO measures that, um, I'm not going to talk about it now, but it's all there on the WHO website, perfectly available public information. Well now, let me just change the terminology a fraction because life expectancy and healthy life expectancy are pretty clumsy to keep on talking about. So let me talk about lifespan versus health span. Health span is a word that a colleague of mine in Australia, um, Paul Nicolarakis, uh, talks about a lot and he introduced me to the term, but it's pretty widely used over the internet if you go looking for it. And there's those concepts just reframed in terms of those words which are easier to say. And because that previous graphic was too detailed to um, uh, to be terribly useful in a setting like this, I've just pulled out one country, which is my country, Australia. And in Australia, in 2019, the average lifespan for everybody, males and females, was 83 years. So the blue line, the blue bar, represents 83 years. The average Australian health span was 71 years. So there's a gap of 12 years. Now, that might not sound too much over the course of a year, but that's one in seven years. It's 14.5% of your whole lifespan. It's 17% of your health span. And what's that filled up with? What is that gap? Well. 
it's something that, you know, for me, as a male, looks something like that. It doesn't look all that nice, does it? I'm not looking forward to that. Now, of course, this graphic isn't designed to say it all comes at the end. Of course, it's, you know, spread for different people throughout that lifespan um, in different proportions, although it is true that a lot of it happens towards the end. But just for the graphic, that's what that 12 years is. It's the unpleasant part of our lives. It's the bit we don't actually want. So in rethinking health and health care, we need to be asking some pertinent questions of our societies, and that is, well, what do they actually want? Now, many of us who work in healthcare actually ask that question of our stakeholders, including our patients, um, quite often. We say, well, what, what is it you, that you want from us? But the trouble is, we ask that question in the context of an ill health system. We ask it from the people from an, an organisation that delivers ill health care to people who are receiving ill health care. So they tell us, oh, we want a better patient experience. Well, yeah, that's what you want out of an ill health services. You, of course you want that. We want better, um, we want more participation in decision making. Well, yeah, yeah, sure, good. We w if you ask a policy maker, they might say, well, we want more value-based care. We want to get better bang for the buck from our societies. But if you actually ask a person who's out of that ill health context, if you actually ask anyone in this room what you want from your health, what you actually want is optimal health. I don't care if my patient experience is good, if I'm, if I'm healthy, I'm not a patient. <laughs> I don't care. But what I do want is optimal health. And that means I want a better ratio between my health span and my lifespan. I want that sick bit to shrink. I want a longer lifespan, most of us want a longer lifespan, in fact there's only one country in the OECD where lifespan is contracting, not extending, and that's the USA. For the rest of us, we experience longer lifespans and we like that. But we also want that proportion of healthy lifespan to be higher. So that's what we actually want. So if we're, right, if we're trying to reimagine healthcare, that's the place we need to start. Then, given that we probably will be crook at some stage, um, then we want those other things. For the one seventh of our Australian life where we are sick, yeah, we want better value-based care. Yep, absolutely. We want more convenience. We want to be part of our health care. We want better uh, patient experiences, etc., etc. But the overarching thing I want, and tell me if you disagree, um, but the overarching thing I want is optimal health, that higher ratio of health span to lifespan. So, my next question was, in reimagining healthcare, don't we then need to think about how we generate health span? Well, this is some, the, there's a number of versions of um, research like this. This one comes out of the University of Wisconsin. I use it because it's, it's fairly widely quoted in the literature. I'm sure you've all seen something similar. Um, Different studies have slightly different numbers, but the, the overall story is the same, no matter which study you look at. It says that if you want length of life and quality of life, if you want that health span, then 80% of it is produced by health behaviours, 
by socioeconomic factors or social and economic factors, physical environment, etc. Now I'm an economist by training and you know, I learned very early about the 80-20 rule. Well, there's your 80-20 rule. So if we want to be building, if we want to be reimagining health and reimagining healthcare to build what people really want, which is optimal health, then why would we start there? Why would we start with the 20%? But that's where we spend all our money. In Australia, that's where we spend 99% of our health budget. And I'm sure it's pretty similar in the rest of your countries as well. But that bit doesn't do very much for our health span. Might be important at times in our life, but it actually doesn't deliver that optimal health that we're all really looking for. So, I would put it to you that for those of us who spend most of our time working in the bottom left-hand quadrant in individual care management services, we're not going to be able to reimagine healthcare and reimagine health and deliver lifespan, uh, sorry, deliver health span unless we start partnering with the other parts of the system that actually do do that. If we want to partake in the most rapidly part, a growing part of the health economy, the wider health economy, then we're going to need to do that partnering. What do I mean by that? Well, health around the world is a $9 trillion industry. We only started measuring the economic impact or the economic size of the wellness industry, formally, in 2014. Only 10 years ago, we've only started measuring that wellness industry. So much for our 80-year-old concept of health being about other things than um, um, infirmity and disease. But already, that wellness industry is about $4.8 trillion. It's already a bit more than half of the size of the health industry. So it is the fastest growing opportunity area for those of us in health care. Because if we know something about health, we probably know something about wealth, uh, wellness as well and about well-being as well. Might not be what we deliver on a day-to-day -day basis, or we might deliver that 20% of it, but we do know something about it. And who's better place than us to actually do something about it and start delivering it? So, if we're going to be reimagining, then we need to start delivering what people want, optimal health, and what they're increasingly showing us that they're willing to pay for, and we need to partner, and we need to start measuring the right things. Good heavens, they say, he might be about to get to the point of the whole talk. Here we go. There it is, the promise of health generated data. We knew it would come eventually. So, again, if you're working in healthcare today, where's the focus of the data in your organisation? You have masses of data in your organisation. But it's all up there in that tiny little bit at the end. And if clinical care is only responsible for 20% of our health outcomes, then all of that data focus, which costs us a lot of money, is only going to deliver 20% of what people are actually wanting and will pay for. The other 80% will be based on patient-generated data. It'll come from surveys, it'll come from smart forms, it'll come from our wearables, it'll come from implantables and other remote measuring devices. Um, 
It'll come from our household appliances. It'll come from our patient reported outcome measures and patient reported experience measures. It'll come from the things we watch and that we drive around in. Do you have any idea how much data the car that you drive around generates these days? Um, I can't remember the quantity offhand, it changes so quickly, but it's enormous. Do you know that most of the large motor um, automobile manufacturers are thinking right now about the health services that they can deliver in those computers on wheels that we all spend so much time in? And that's all they are today. They're just big computers on wheels. And they send off an awful lot of data. So my car knows exactly when I've been to a health service. It knows the healthy and the unhealthy in, uh, environments I have it. It knows the air quality that I breathe when I go to various places. It knows an awful lot of things about my health. You know, I've got my hands on a steering wheel a lot of the time. You can measure things when you've got hands on things. There's an awful lot of things that just are coming out of the automotive industry. Watch that one. But my point is, most of the data that will deliver that extended health span, we don't collect at all. As health organisations, we just, we don't even watch it go by us. We're oblivious, in fact, to it just passing us all by. And yet, that's the key to the biggest growth part of the market. And it's the biggest key to what our populations actually want. But, hey, we're busy with that other little bit. Not so little bit. Others are capturing it, though. There's lots of organisations that are capturing that patient-generated data. And why? Because they know they'll then be able to capture the majority share of that biggest growth in the health and wellbeing market. And so why are you know, companies that are non-traditional health service providers moving into healthcare? Because they're already tapped in to this data that actually does make a difference. By the way, the Patient generated data can help with the, uh, uh, the other unhealthy bit too. Um, if you're going to be developing, uh, uh, delivering value based care, then the, whole, the value, the capital V value in, in value based care is outcomes. It's about outcomes that matter to people, not about outcomes that matter to clinicians. So it's often more about things like functional status than about clinical markers. Or how are you going to get that? Patient generated data is the only way to get it. And you can go through the other things. If you want to be talking about the quality of service, then you have to ask people what they think about the service. That's patient generated data. If we want to personalise data, yeah, there's a whole sort of genomic approach to that, to the, to the therapies, etc. But if we want to personalise how people experience care, then we have to ask them what matters to them in that care experience. Patient-generated data, it's the only way you can do it. If you want people to self-manage, to try and take pressures off the health system, then you have to get information from people. You have to, it's patient-generated data that's the key to all of those things. Now, some people are realising that, so the first statement there, the first quote comes from the US Centers for Disease Control. Potential impact is great, but still to be fully realised. Um, and basically that's because they suddenly realised that we're mostly dealing with chronic conditions in our healthcare, um, in our health world today. And um, guess what? Most of the management of that happens outside our transactional data collection systems. So again, if you want to do chronic disease, you have to rely on patient-generated data. And 
the last comment is from the US uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and, and Quality, um, saying, yes, there is increasing evidence that patient-generated data can actually help. But the problem is, most of the research we do doesn't even focus on health outcomes. It focuses on things like efficiency. Again, let me state it very clearly. As a healthy person, I want an extended healthy life. I don't want to be a patient at all. Yeah, for this part of my life, I care about whether something's efficient or not. But for this part of my life, it's outcomes that I'm interested in. And we don't measure it. So what is happening? Well, there are actually very few around the world examples of the large scale use of patient generated health data. And overwhelmingly, the reviews suggest that even where organisations capture it, it is not integrated with the other data that we hold, that our healthcare systems hold about people. So it's treated as a separate thing part of that famous fragmentation of health service that limits our effectiveness so beautifully. Organisational settings don't favour patient-generated health data. Our health administrators and our clinicians say, no, this is the stuff that we collect. We don't worry about all of that airy-fairy stuff. People will say, well, you can't trust the data quality of, um, of patient-generated uh, health data. Well, look, I'm a data guy. Anyone who's looked at any health data anywhere in the world will give a little laughing snort under their breath about that one. A lot of health data that we capture in our health organisations is absolutely dreadful. And here's a real beauty for you. Even where we collect patient-reported outcome measures, Systematic review tells us that patients aren't even involved or are under-involved in their development the majority of the time. I mean, it defied beggars' belief. We want people to report on things, but we don't ask them what they think they should report on. It's either gross stupidity or gross arrogance, as far as I can see. So. Promise of patient-generated health data? Well, if you want to be a part of the game of reimagining healthcare and you really want to take it seriously and deliver health span, then that's the place where you need to look. And for those other things that we keep saying that we want about our health service delivery part, it's also the patient-generated health data that shows the most promise for us. Thank you.